Well, good afternoon, eggheads. Happy Friday. Such a glorious day today. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell for New Egg Studios. I'm excited to chat some tech. I'm really stoked to, uh, to kind of break down some of the gear with our good pals at ASUS. Um, I really, I don't want to waste a lot of time. There's some cool stuff to talk about. I want to jump right in. We've got a contest that we've got to talk about. So a graphics card we're going to be giving away. But if you're familiar with our channel and with our live streams, you've no doubt caught some of his technical deep dives, some of the PC build videos we've worked on together. If if you aren't as familiar with our live streams, I think you're in for a treat. Uh, uh, JJ, <laughs> I kind of stumbled on the landing there. Uh, JJ, thank you so much for, for joining us on another stream. We've got some really fun stuff to talk about today. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for the intro, man. Uh, fantastic to be able to join us again for a really cool stream to be able to talk about uh, really the kind of long term history between Asus and NVIDIA. And I think some really cool products in terms of kind of just improving the gaming experience when it comes to monitors and graphics cards. So like you said, there's definitely going to be a lot to talk about and is always excited to be able to talk about them with you uh, and the new entire Newegg audience. And I want to thank everybody for joining the stream. And, and just as a as a brief introduction, um, what you're doing at ASUS these days, what your role is um, uh, with their with their company? Yeah, yeah, um, I've been with ASUS for almost about 15 years, so pretty good chunk of time uh, as far as with the company. Um, and uh, my role is a, as part of kind of the marketing department. Uh, I handle a kind of technical product marketing manager, so help to coordinate between our product marketing team as well as uh, have a position on our social media team to help to kind of really be uh, you know an ambassador and engage within our internal team and then along with the community and help to be able to provide insight and information and understanding to our users. Um, and also, of course, coordinate internally with our teams, with our product development team, our product marketing team. Teams, uh, to hopefully help to you know execute our launches you know when we're talking about the latest and greatest monitors uh, graphics cards and so many of the other great products that we have under the ASUS portfolio and I'm always stoked to join you on one of these streams because like I I feel like I got a pretty good handle on what's going on but I always find like I'm learning something when you're getting to break this stuff down this is this, these are always some of my favorite videos to produce um so before we jump in uh chatting some of these new monitors and these new graphics cards um, I do want to just a little bit of housekeeping here, a little shout out from the uh, the production team here at Newegg. I, I mean, there's this uh, this RTX 3070 Ti that's just kind of sitting around and we want to make sure it goes to a good home. So uh, if you catch the description and you catch some of the links that we've been sharing on social media, there's there's like this this contest form that you can put in some information and get yourself entered to potentially uh, take that graphics card home. Um, again, it's just like this adorable little puppy that I hope goes to a loving and caring household. Um, so definitely jump on that because uh, that, that I, I, from what I hear, it's it's a pretty good graphics card. So maybe maybe you might want to give it a spin. Who knows? It could happen. <laughs> yeah, definitely agree. Um, we were really excited to be able to, of course, work with. Uh, internally here in ASUS and uh, with Newegg to be able to offer this giveaway. We definitely understand, you know, the reality of the situation. And while I definitely think a lot of what we're going to be talking about on the monitor side could be applicable to users that are have, you know, current generation and prior generation graphics cards, as well as users that are going to be building systems uh, brand new, you know, we definitely want to be able to kind of uh, offer something to the community and uh, let you guys have, a, you know, access to be able to get one of the definitely latest, greatest cards with uh, the ROG 6. Uh, 3070 Ti. So it's a pretty sweet card when you definitely talk about its, uh, you know, performance as well as its aesthetics. Oh, definitely. So, um, uh, JJ, I, we, we've got a, we got a show breakdown here and there were some topics that we wanted to jump into. Um, I, I kind of wanted to start off, uh, sort of picking your brain, it, you know, from the new egg perspective, because we kind of help distribute some of this gear. It's been really interesting watching that relationship between Asus and Nvidia evolve over time. And, and, and it's kind of like the back and forth. It's not just, you know, we make this one product and then, you know, uh, another company has to respond and make a complementary product. I'm sure that this collaboration is, is becoming much more bi-directional. Like as you're getting feedback from your customers, that's getting delivered to uh, you know Nvidia to kind of help influence the future of their products. I was I was hoping you could kind of break some of that down for us. Yeah, no, um, you know it's actually a, a fantastic relationship. It's one that ASUS I think really prides itself on in terms of kind of both being companies that really focus on innovation, quality, and performance, and I think commitment to gamers. You know, both of us unquestionably have kind of this um, philosophy to really be able to offer gamers an amazing experience. So there's a natural synergy between kind of the way that we look at the products and the technologies that we want to afford to you know to uh, to the users that are out there. And you know, if we look back across our history, right, um, we've really been a kind of key partner with Nvidia. 
um, throughout, you know, uh, I think true milestone launches in the industry, which have kind of changed the game, right? When you talk mm -hmm. about even the original G-Sync implementation, 2013, we were a key launch partner, not only launching monitors with native G-Sync, but even before that, some of you might not be aware, the first G-Sync monitor was actually a DIY kit. You actually <laughs> uh, took one of our VG series monitor, V series monitors, and you actually got the G-Sync module, you opened it up and you installed it. And it was kind of groundbreaking to really be able to introduce this new type of technology where you were adaptively synchronizing the refresh rate to, of course, the output uh, rendering from the graphics card. Um, that's, you know, a great example there. And of course, you know, everything from being a key partner at all the launches for GPUs, of course, a key partner at helping to roll out technologies, things like Max-Q and high performance, you know, uh, true high performance uh, laptop based gaming is a kind of a, just an extension where really, I think across the portfolio, whether we're talking about our system products or component products, monitor products where we've consistently been at the forefront, you know, 120, 140, 240, now 360 hertz. And, uh, you know, while definitely we're not going to be talking about anything new, we're on the journey to a thousand hertz. We're going to continue to be right. working really progressively with NVIDIA, I think, to try to offer the absolute best experience as possible. And um, that's definitely been something that has happened, you know, um, clearly over the last decade and actually been longer than that. So we're really excited about this partnership and this collaboration that we've had. All right. So, um, and, and like I said, on our side, it's always exciting to see, cause I feel like we hear the, these, uh, these new technologies that are being derived or developed when, when we see them realized into consumer facing products and we actually get to go hands on, like, hopefully when I'm back in the new egg studios, <laughs> again, to, like get to play and manhandle some of these products. Um, it, it's always that, like that last step, that realization of something that I heard about in a press release that now it's, it's in front of me and it really does seem to be contributing uh, to improving gameplay. That's always kind of the, uh, that, the childlike wonder, that excitement that really uh, gets me interested in, uh, in, in, in following up on, on what can be kind of sometimes a little boring, like, oh, well, we're going to do this and we're going to package it like this. And then a product shows up and suddenly something I didn't think was possible in gaming is sitting right in front of me. It's, it's, it, it always kind of makes me a little giddy when, uh, when I get to go hands on. Yeah, I think, you know, just to kind of end there on that point, um, I think that's a really good way to look at even a lot of what we're going to try to talk about here in the stream is that it's really about the experiences that I think that are kind of coming together when we bring together the technology from NVIDIA and we bring it into the product realization that we're offering, um, you know, through our graphics cards, through our monitor products. Because a lot of times, you know, you're going to be talking, we're going to be talking about a lot of quote unquote technology terms, right? We're going to be talking about G-Sync, Adaptive Sync, HDR, response time, reflex, DLS, RTX, right? Um, you know, total graphics board power, right? There's so many kind of little things, but at the end of the day, really what it comes down to is trying to ensure that the gamers um, and the enthusiasts that are out there really get a great experience. And that's really our focus, I think, especially under ASUS's commitment within these type of products that we're gonna be talking about is that we wanna elevate the experience and um, you know, give that to you, you know, as a way to be able to ultimately just have that better experience when you're gaming. And I think the cool part too, is that when we're talking about here, um, you know, while we're gonna definitely be talking about some, you know, premium high-end products, like with things like, you know, our flagship HDR monitors, we're mm -hmm. also gonna have some really strong value-based oriented products. So just because, um, you know, a lot of the focus sometimes is always like on the top end of the spectrum. I think definitely for those of you who are interested in terms of finding out, hey, is there a rationale for me upgrading from this four-year-old monitor that I might have? Um, we're going to be trying to cover, I think, a pretty good gamut. So across the range, you know, you can hopefully gain insight in terms of the experience improvements that will be possible if you're looking, you know, to upgrade your, your monitor or even your graphics card or both at the same time. Well, and one of the things that I've always appreciated with our conversations getting to do these live streams where I get to be just as much of a fan um, as, as like a show host for this kind of a stuff, um, that from the outside looking in gamer gear is this like Mountain Dew fueled crazy aesthetic. But internally, especially over the last couple of years, I think I, I don't think I've been as excited as I've been recently to see sort of the, the fine tuning and the nuance like really customizing a hardware package with the right software support for a particular style of gameplay, um, where if someone is more esports driven, if someone is more first person shooter or battle royale driven, someone's more of like a narrative or arcadey gamer like I am, it, it's not just I get this one, it, this is a gamer monitor and all gamers use this monitor. It's, it's really crafting and, and fine tuning a wholly unique experience to that individual so that they can maximize the type of gameplay they enjoy most. Yeah, no, you're, you're hundred percent right. You know, I think, uh, um, PC gaming, it's a, it's a massive, you know, um, 
you know, pie, right? When we talk about the actual users that make up that, that quote unquote pie, right? It is really everybody from somebody that's playing, you know, Ori in the Blind Forest to the latest, you know, crowdfunded indie game to of course, action RPGs like Divinity Original Sin to the <laughs> Warzone, you know, to of course, you know, Cyberpunk, um, you know, to kind of No Man's Sky, right? It, it kind of covers an entire spectrum. And equally, I think that that's kind of the great thing about a lot of what we're talking about is that the monitors and kind of the graphics cards and everything that we're talking to is that they are kind of segmentationally positioned and designed to be able to complement different swaths of gamers. So while sometimes a lot of the focus gets put on, you know, the premier AAA, let's say latest shooter or kind of esports yeah. title, um, you know, I think a lot of the gamers here on the stream will appreciate the fact that, you know, we're going to try to cover a pretty good basis and uh, try to be mindful of that. You know, there might be some monitors that might be better suited towards that. Like you said, if you're into kind of platforming uh, fidelity and immersion, you know, more single player narrative campaign style, then let's say jumping into competitive maps so you can keep bumping up the ladder and you want the best absolute uh, system <laughs> latency and the best motion clarity, you know, there's going to be one option for you versus another option. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a perfect place to kick off. And um, I, I think it's probably a, a good idea to sort of start with a, a just sort of a, a broad overview. There are a number of technologies that are going into monitors that are being hyped up by monitors and, and especially kind of uh, piggybacking on our intro, talking about your relationship with NVIDIA. Um, what, what are some of those high level talking points that gamers should be looking for with um, things like G-Sync, for example? Yeah. So, you know, when you take a look at a, a monitor, there's going to be a lot of technologies, like you said, that are going to be present in monitors now, you know, so, um, you know, the, the general kind of high level specifications you're going to be looking at, are, of course, going to be things like response time. Uh, you might be looking at, of course, panel types. So whether it's something like an IPS versus a VA versus like a TN based panel, um, you're going to have, of course, your refresh rate, uh, you'll have the dimensions and you'll have the resolution. And then, of course, a critical part to that, like you noted, is going to be G-Sync. Um, so G-Sync, probably for most of you, you know, now has that really been around for quite some time and essentially it's an adaptive synchronization technology. It allows you to essentially uh, help to have a smoother and more responsive and clearer gaming experience because it will essentially take the graphics card and the output render rate of this graphics card and match it with the refresh rate of the monitor. Um, so, you know, in the past, right, you were generally, if you had like a 60 Hertz monitor, uh, you really only kind of had two options. Either you'd have like V-Sync turning it off or you had like V-Sync turning it on. And neither was really kind of ideal because one would limit the fluidity and kind of your frame rate. And then in kind of, you know, the other scenario where you had V-Sync turned on, it'd be also not necessarily ideal because you could introduce stutter and you could introduce other kind of limiting factors. So when you then were essentially able to incorporate uh, the NVIDIA G-Sync module within uh, monitors, as we noted in, in 2013, you essentially helped to kind of get to this really uh, revolutionary next standard where you could have a much, much better experience. Um, and now though, flash forward to kind of 2021 to your point is that there will be three levels of G-Sync technology that are present throughout the monitors that we're gonna be talking about. So there will be a G-Sync compatible, uh, then there will be a standard G-Sync, and then there will be G-Sync Ultimate. Um, and each one respectively uh, kind of continues to improve and offers, of course, gamers an even better class of experience. And critically also an area that we'll, I think, talk a little bit about will be validation. Um, you know, some people kind of wonder is like, what's really the value of kind of having a G-Sync module? And to NVIDIA's credit, uh, a critical part to the experience is really what I would call vertical integration. NVIDIA really helps define a, a tight kind of a level of validation between the GPU, the driver, and the entire chain going into the monitor. And that allows them to unlock and maximize very specialized options. Like when we talk about the upcoming uh, ROG Swift 360 Hertz monitor, there's a specialized esports mode that's only possible because there's a G-Sync module in there. And NVIDIA was actually able to hand tune the entire operating parameters for the panel specific to games to even offer a higher level of performance. So even offer, even though we offer like a G-Sync compatible display that will be similar in terms of kind of some of the performance benchmarks, it will still not be able to offer that highest level of kind of performance offering that you would have when you have that native G-Sync module. And uh, there is a lot that's going on in there. You know, uh, when we talk mm -hmm. about something like a G-Sync based module, you know, the first generation alone was quite impressive. It was an FPGA module. It had 768 megabytes of DDR3 memory. We flash forward to then the first uh, HDR implementation, which moved up to DDR4, three gigabytes worth of memory and uh, even more advanced FPGA module. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that it's packing in directly. So it is important to understand that when you're taking a look at 
a monitor that features that G-Sync um, label and that G-Sync Ultimate label, you're you're not only talking about the the quote unquote uh, traditional specifications for the monitor, but you're talking about that tight integration that that uh, module integrates and with the panel design and development, and then everything that we do from kind of fine tuning uh, the the panel's design, and of course a lot of the specialized features and functions that we'll add in to supplement that. Um, so. Those are kind of, I think, on the high level, uh, you know, some of those critical mm -hmm. points that you want to keep in mind. But tying into that also, you know, we spoke a little bit earlier about gaming. Um, you know, it's important. I usually tell people, try to define, you know, your top three to five games that you're going to play and uh, target the resolution that you're looking at, because that will help you to kind of start to focus in at understanding where where your kind of monitor selection might gravitate towards. Right. If you're playing Apex Legends, Warzone, Fortnite, you know, and Counter-Strike, that might mean that I'm gonna maybe uh, you know start gravitating towards all you know at least right. uh, high refresh rate, if not ultra high refresh rate, versus where I'm playing an 8K monitor for Fortnite, right? That's, that's yeah, yeah. I so like you know if you're if you're gonna be playing like a mix, like you know, or in the Blind Forest, and then Cyberpunk, right. and you know, No Man's Sky and Divinity Sin, maybe you want to go towards maybe fidelity, right, and immersion. But the great thing is that also high refresh rate is now becoming kind of the standard. So even I think within the value segment that we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking almost at the baseline still 165 hertz all the way up to, you know, 360. So um, yeah. it's not really a question of any more of having to kind of have that limitation between not having a high level of refresh um, and resolution. So that's a great thing to also keep in mind there. Well, I, let's um let, let's actually do let's jump into some of the individual monitors. We've got some fun B roll. I can pull up some of the web links and, and kind of back up what you're talking about. I, I've been critically excited um where like like you were saying even a couple years ago there was this stark trade-off between resolution or high refresh and then i, I think over the last couple of years we've kind of found this sweet spot for uh, quad hd where quad hd was starting to find that higher refresh rate and um what was was getting more accessible it wasn't prohibitively expensive to crank up 120 hertz at 2560. um and and now we're, we're we're starting to talk about 4k panels that are that are able to drive that more fluid that more fluid game rate at the same time all of that tech has trickled down into 1080p gaming at absolutely mind-boggling um, refresh rate numbers. So uh, where 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 should we start? Do we want to start at the high end at the, uh, in the resolution side or do we want to jump in? Yeah, I, I think we can uh, probably start off, I think, with a kind of like a 4K. Um, before we jump into that, though, I do just want to give a couple of quick clarification points. So I know I talked about kind of the three versions of G-Sync. So again, um, just to kind of give some specificity, right? So mm -hmm. under G-Sync compatible, when we talk about these monitors, we'll know kind of whether the monitor has G-Sync compatible, G-Sync or G-Sync Ultimate. Uh, G-Sync compatible um, is a kind of fairly new. Uh, NVIDIA helped to extend uh, offering essentially a wider level of validation to monitors to meet essentially no uh, validated artifacts while gaming. Mm. Um, so that's important in terms of that if you pair that with, you know, essentially a wide range of NVIDIA GPUs that will support uh, G-Sync. So that could mean, you know, 30 series, could be 20 series, 10 series, even prior generations. You can all fully enable G-Sync and be able to have that responsive gaming experience, right? Uh, in terms of, excuse me, a responsive and tear-free gaming. So that's really kind of the core attribute. When you step up to the next level, G-Sync, which includes the G-Sync module, mm -hmm. um, you're really stepping up to not only validation for no artifacts, but there's um, an extensive level of internal lab validation that NVIDIA does. So there's, um, you know, I think around 300 plus tests that are actually done where they use specialized equipment, they actually check the panel, they check actually aspects like flicker, they check aspects like uh, response performance consistency, um, color performance, many, many, many attributes that are kind of coordinated between the design and development between us when we're producing the monitors, we're selecting those panels and we're coordinating with NVIDIA because of course we're utilizing that G-Sync module within the monitor, which is con uh, taking over the standard um, responsibilities of something that you would call like a scaler, which would be the traditional way that you would help to kind of drive the panel along with other aspects. Um, so that is kind of a critical part. And this does provide a legitimate experience because what I can tell you is that sometimes people that might pick up a non quote unquote uh, G-Sync kind of validated monitor, they can still turn that option on. NVIDIA gives you the option mm -hmm. to turn this or toggle it on into the driver, but they actually might find that there could be a non-optimal experience. You could get kind of uh, certain types of uh, blanking that might occur during the rendering, or there could be certain types of flickering, or there could be certain types of other experiences. So that's kind of an important differentiation. Um, there's also an element that is called overdriving. Um, overdriving in terms of your pixels helps to help to 
kind of improve motion clarity. It's a key part of that is you generally get to like a faster monitor with better response time. Um, it is an option that you can generally customize called an overdrive setting. But a critical part to having the NVIDIA module inside the monitor is, is that it does a, a more advanced work in terms of the overdrive processing. Um, and so you can generally have a superior overdrive experience. Um, and when we move over to the last segment, which will actually segue into our first kind of monitor that we'll talk about with the PG32 UQX um, is going to be G-Sync Ultimate. There's actually very few number of uh, G-Sync Ultimate monitors, and we were happy to really help to kick this off originally in terms of this series. But this is your flagship series. It will have the G-Sync module. Um, you'll have the validation in terms of the artifacts, all that full testing. Um, but it's also kind of been specifically tuned for HDR experience. And it also has to meet a minimum requirement of display HDR 1000, if not greater. Um, and that's important because while you do have other um, display HDR standards like HDR 600 or even HDR 400, to really, I think, get the kind of the most immersive experience uh, from HDR, you really do want to be able to drive your brightness levels um, you know, at at least that 1000 nits, if not higher to really be able to show you that strong kind of dynamic range and really have that kind of color pop. So that's uh, kind of clarity in terms of understanding that G-Sync compatible, G-Sync and G-Sync Ultimate, which like I said, I think now we can uh, segue into the first monitor with the, yeah, the PG32 sure. UQX. Here, let me, um, I, and let me uh, screen share this because I've got the site pulled up so that we can, we can kind of uh, focus on this while we're, while we're chatting this out. Um, but yeah, it, um, it, it's really exciting to see all the big numbers <laughs> from resolution yes, uh, and frame rate, and uh, and and I I can't find anything that really seems like I'd be making much of a compromise, which is I I think the feeling someone should have when <laughs> they're investing in um, a premium tier product like this. Hundred um, percent. You know, so with the PG32 UQX, really kind of the goal here was to really be able to offer I think the best in class experience. Um, for like I said, HDR fidelity um, while still introducing a high level of refresh rate. So historically, right, uh, for quite a number of years, there was a limitation that you could have like 4K and you could have G-Sync, but you were talking like 60 Hertz, right? So right. you're missing out on really offering that smoother and even kind of more responsive and superior level of motion clarity that was possible. So when we were able to introduce essentially this type of monitor, which gives you the 4K, it gives you 144 Hertz, an IPS-based display, a display HDR rating of 1400, which is the highest amongst a gaming monitor, right? Um, it's a truly next level experience. You know, sadly, because we're talking about a stream here, there's no way for us to be able to show you <laughs> the, the sheer uh, impressiveness right. of what it looks like when you uh, talk about seeing um, HDR and, uh, you know, a thousand and even up to that 1400 nits. You know, you walk into a game like, you know, Call of Duty, uh, Battlefield, For uh, Forza. Um, it's really uh, a night and day experience. The great thing too is from a performance perspective, HDR doesn't necessarily have like a penalty in the same way that other fidelity enhancements do. Um, you know, the, of course, graphics cards, when we get into talking about, there's a lot of great technology NVIDIA has with Ampere, especially with things like, you know, um, second generation RTX and DLS and many other things that help to even elevate fidelity further. But HDR is generally kind of no performance penalty. For the most part, you pretty much can toggle it on if the game allows for it. And what you're really gonna see is a whole nother layer of immersion when it comes to the colors and the contrast that's available in the game. And exciting also, of course, with recent announcements like Windows 11, as well as updates uh, done by yeah. Microsoft is that there will be um, auto HDR coming to the PC platform that is being leveraged from the Xbox console side. And this is gonna mean that literally there's gonna be, um, I think hundreds of almost not more than a thousand titles that will see automatic HDR, what's called a kind of a tone mapping, um, which will mean that even though the games might not have been designed with essentially that high dynamic range, um, there's already a, a pretty a pretty good chunk of games really, um, I think right now probably comfortably even popular games, we're talking over, over probably 75 titles um, that have quality HDR implementations that are present. Um, but when you get this kind of a forthcoming update that'll come later through Windows, you're really gonna be able to evolve with this. So this is a monitor that right now, of course, you could jump in something like Cyberpunk. Um, you, like I said, you could jump into Battlefield, you could jump into uh, Warzone, um, but you're gonna, it's only gonna get better, right? And especially with having such high class specifications, right? It's really offering you a whole nother experience. And there's other, some, some cool things too in the monitor here. You know, this monitor also does introduce an integrated, the first time we actually integrated a secondary display here. Uh, it's very similar to our motherboards where it actually has 
um, an actual customizable display where you can have things like your frame rate be displayed. Uh, there's actually mm -hmm. a USB port that is on top of the monitor so that if you want to connect things like a secondary light or maybe a camera, uh, you don't have to worry about kind of running secondary auxiliary cables, uh, things along those lines. So this is really for those that are looking for that, um, you know, highest level of fidelity, highest level of immersion and very, very good motion clarity and, and good response. Um, this is really going to, I think, kind of be the benchmark monitor for really the entirety of 2021. <laughs> this is it. This is this is the crown jewel right here. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and um, I don't know. I think I might have shared an image with you, uh, JC. But there will mm -hmm. be a, a kind of a secondary monitor. This monitor has started to roll up now in terms of availability. So of course you can sure. check it out. As uh, you know, we'll continue to work in New to get this one listed. Uh, but there will be kind of a secondary follow up monitor, which will be the PG three two UQ. Of course, the UQX is an amazing monitor, but it definitely comes in at a pretty expensive price tag. Um, the UQ will essentially not feature the really uh, specialized technology that is here on this panel, which is going to be mini LED. Mini LED is really the most advanced form of backlighting that's available right now, which is what allows you to have such high brightness that's going to achieve because you can literally have, you know, thousands of those uh, LEDs that are present right. in there allowing for localized illumination, which is really what allows for such impressive brightness display. Um, so we'll kind of be offering a very similar monitor, but without mini LED backlighting. So you'll still be able mm -hmm. to have high refresh rate, um, up to 144, uh, 140 hertz, uh, 32 inches. It will be G-Sync compatible, um, I believe HDR 600. Um, and that model will be coming out probably next month, around ne next month time frame as we move into a maybe potentially August. Um, but that one will also feature HDMI 2.1. So for those of you that are on the stream that maybe kind of want to switch back and forth between gaming on your PC and maybe even your console, um, right. If you want to take advantage of a course variable refresh rate on your consoles, that might be a monitor that you also want to take a look at. Because for most of you gamers, of uh, course, you're going to generally be using DisplayPort as far as your active connection on these monitors. Well, and it's interesting watching, um, you know, kind of console gaming follow in the footsteps, you know, uh, making making that transition into uh, some of the terminology that we've just taken for granted in PC gaming and, and we're watching them overlap more than I think uh, I, I think we've ever seen in the past. Um, the, these new Xboxes and PlayStations just seem like baby living room PCs anyway. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see how we can kind of combine or attach some of these gaming experiences. Yeah, and I think, you know, for us, of course, we realize that there's, uh, you know, there's, of course, gamers exist in a lot of different ways in terms of the games that they play. Um, definitely, I think any uh, PC enthusiast realizes, though, that when you talk about the peak of image fidelity and, of course, immersion, the PC still definitely <laughs> reigns in terms of not only the resolution, the refresh rate, the flexibility of being able to customize the experience through different types of filters, uh, which we'll actually talk about in terms of some of the uh, GeForce options. They have some extraordinary filter options that are being made available, and with things like even more advancements are coming in with DirectX 12 and things along those lines. Some really cool stuff, but um, kind of, I think moving from 4K, kind of the next bracket, I think is probably really gonna be one of the most popular ones and be a real, probably very popular monitor for the duration of 2021 and even moving into 2022, which will be the 1440p high refresh rate. So yeah. historically 1440p, as you noted, right? It's really becoming the trend in terms of the resolution, right? Where we're seeing a large shift from gamers that are finally kind of moving over from 1080p into 1440p, Kind of one of those bottlenecks was that um, you know 1440p was kind of limited in terms of not seeing that same ultra high refresh rate, right? So when we talk about refresh rates, historically, of course, we see uh, pretty much every monitor was 60 hertz. Uh, F, you know, for your information, if you're not aware, 60 hertz was originally defined because it came from CRTs, and the 60 hertz refresh rate was linked in actually to the electrical grid. Um, it was closely matched so that there was minimal interference um, uh, between essentially the electrical signal and the CRT and the electrical grid. So that's what kind of kept 60 hertz as kind of being a standard for so long that even when we transitioned from CRTs into LCDs, 60 hertz kind of stayed there because it can be kind of became the industry standard. But as we moved into then high refresh rate, 120, it was around for a little while, and then we moved into 144. Um, and now you've kind of seen that sweet spot. I'd say that 144 up to about the 170 is kind of becoming that new kind of sweet spot. But not that long ago, of course, um, you know, Asus helped to also help to really break that uh, envelope and get further with 240. We've got 280. Now we've got 360. Um, but really exciting for 4040p with the PG279QM, right? We're going to be offering 1440p, 240 hertz. So this is a really exciting monitor because now you're finally getting to that 
ultra high refresh rate level, yeah. which um, offers a big jump up in terms of motion clarity and responsiveness, and is also going to bring along some new technologies from NVIDIA, like NVIDIA Reflex, which, again, very similar to what was introduced with G-Sync, is a, a supplemental technology, but I think also quite revolutionary in terms of giving gamers more information, but also getting beyond just motion clarity improvements, uh, but to really actually help to improve what's called responsiveness and, and addressing aspects like display chain latency. Um, so evaluating kind of the entirety of everything that goes into what you see on the screen and helping to improve upon that experience. So um, yeah, I think you can see right here, you brought it up, uh, the PG279QM. So 1440p, right, fast IPS-based display. Uh, 240 hertz, this is a display HDR 400 base panel. So while you're definitely not seeing uh, the peak, uh, you know, uh, HDR performance of like in a 1000 nit monitor, uh, 400 though is still actually gonna be a, a big bump up for a lot of you uh, users. If you probably check the brightness on your current monitor, many users are usually probably somewhere around 200 to maybe a, a little bit below 300 nits. I usually say for any new monitor that you're probably considering, look at getting something at least in that 275 to 300 nit, if not greater rating. Um, it just adds some some uh, some additional kind of pop and vibrancy and kind of uh, just overall better contrast and uh, you know dynamic range for the monitor when you're able to step up to that. So while you're not necessarily gonna be looking at this, like I said, from an HDR kind of super immersion experience, it still provides really, really impressive performance. Um, but you add that in there with, like I said, the, the NVIDIA, NVIDIA Reflex and the rest of the specifications. And I think this is gonna be a very, very popular kind of sweet spot monitor. Well, and, and especially like I was saying earlier for crafting that kind of specific you know, again, there, there, there is going, there are going to be solutions for people that are, that are looking. Yeah. I, I always kind of draw this back to some of my experiences, like, uh, in, in trying to craft like cinema, um, experience, like I really want a movie to look as amazing as I possibly can. Um, and there are different screens that are going to tackle some of those different duties in, in specific ways. And, and especially seeing like there, the trade-off here, the compromise here isn't so extreme if you still want to enjoy the the hdr quality the hdr content but you're you're seriously ramping up that frame rate it's a very specific choice that you can make to hone in on something like this that um that kind of achieves a a, a double whammy stepping you up resolution wise and offering a, a much more fluid experience too yeah and and definitely um like i said it's not just the fluidity but that responsive nice right with the nvidia reflex um it does require game compatibility support right mm -hmm. but nvidia has worked really closely uh, to really actually be able to offer nvidia reflex in a lot of the premier titles where you can really see an, an advantage in this really in terms of helping you to provide uh, more kind of responsive aiming um, and overall better alignment with you know, when you're clicking something, actually seeing that realized at that at, at that time in the screen. Um, what's actually occurring there is that without kind of getting super technical, if you actually go to NVIDIA's site, you'll actually see some really good information regarding this. But generally the CPU uh, creates what's called a render queue. So essentially it's creating like these frames and the frames get fed to the graphics card. Um, this in itself though is actually creating some latency because there's actually like this queue of all this information that then has to be processed by the graphics card. More optimally, what NVIDIA has done here with Reflex is kind of helped to eliminate that queue and pair up the CPU rendering um, along with the GPU at the same time. So you're essentially kind of cutting out that portion there and helping that synchronicity to occur. Um, when you kind of tie that in together uh, and you toggle that function on within the game engine, you can significantly help to improve the overall kind of responsiveness and the overall end-to-end -end latency. And the really cool part to having this monitor is that when you pair it with, let's say, uh, you know, mice that we have, we have actually now um, five uh, NVIDIA Reflex certified mice, like our Gladius 3 um, and other mice, uh, you can connect this all together and be able to even see this all realized on screen where you can see your render latency, you can see the game latency, you can help to kind of fine tune everything so you can really help to get the kind of the best experience possible. And this even works even further with some really cool options like uh, NVIDIA has built in even automatic uh, GPU tuning to your uh, to the graphics card software that they have within GeForce Experience. You might wonder, well, why do I need that? Well. Um, PC performance can be improved by pushing clock speeds. Uh, so whether you're pushing a faster CPU, whether you're pushing uh, your graphics card a little bit faster, that will allow you to even get faster rendering performance, which can then actually even then further improve uh, your responsiveness. So um, especially with ASUS being a leader in overclocking, right, and designing hardware that's kind of built for that, um, this is kind of like a, a stacking scenario, right, where you can go, okay, let me first stack in the monitor, stack in my graphics card, 
stack in maybe my uh, AI <laughs> overclocking on our motherboard, then adaptive tuning on the graphics card side, right? Um, add in, you know, my uh, Asus reflex based mouse and like you're just stacking and stacking and stacking, you know, uh, so that you can have that uh, competitive edge, right? Um, but it's cool because uh, as an enthusiast, it just is giving you options, right? Um, and, you know, uh, if I didn't kind of reinforce, like again, you know, you got Apex Legends, Destiny 2, Fortnite, Valorant, um, CSGO. Um, these are all games that actually have support for this in NVIDIA's, uh, just like we've seen with things like DLSS and uh, RTX. Oh, right. We'll continue to scale out even more games over time. So it's a really exciting technology uh, to offer to gamers and really kind of unprecedented. Well, and it, it's exciting because it sounds like the beginnings of a platform where a couple years back, it seemed there were a number of individual efforts from hardware manufacturers to supply some of this. If it was kind of built into a monitor or there was a monitor graphics card combination that could achieve some of this. And it just seems to make more sense where if we're going to be leveraging NVIDIA technologies on NVIDIA products and and uh, your your side, you know, Asus is going to be working with NVIDIA on crafting um sort of a framework for all of these new technologies to operate in. It, it, you don't have to completely reinvent the wheel on your own to improve some of these experiences if it's, you know, uh, better aim assistance. You know, I, I remember there was that, that mini fad where you'd have like black frame insertion on certain kinds of monitors to help smooth out the judder of someone's, of someone's hand. Now it seems like we've got a better holistic overview of how to incorporate accessories monitors, graphics cards into this a bit more holistically. Yeah, and I think, you know, even as we kind of get into our next monitor, you even talking about something mm -hmm. like BlackBerry insertion is actually a good point because I think that's another area that we want to um, kind of help to touch on here. There's going to be a lot of specialized technologies that exist on the NVIDIA side, but also even on the ASUS side within our monitors mm -hmm. that sometimes it can be a little bit kind of of a process to really kind of spend the time to understand your product, to figure out what are all the knobs and switches that I can adjust to help to have me have the best performance possible. Um, take for instance, like we offer on many of our monitors ELMB and ELMB sync. Um, this is what is referred to as essentially backlight strobing. And this yeah. can actually alongside let's say even things like a high refresh rate and a low response time help to give you a uh, a better motion clarity experience. Um, but you might find that algorithmically based on the way that the strobing technology works, um, you might find that it's favorable in maybe one game environment specific in, in certain scenarios. And then maybe in other scenarios, you maybe don't want to have it enabled. Um, and so there might be kind of situations you as a gamer, you kind of understanding the whole toolbox that you have available, right? Whether it's something like, you know, from, you know, options on the GPU side, like RTX to DLSS to Reflex to, you know, ELMB, is it goes, let me go, okay, when I'm jumping in here, I can take advantage of this, right? And when I'm maybe doing this, I can take advantage of this to ultimately help to give me that best experience, whether I'm maybe looking to prioritize something like image quality or whether mm -hmm. I'm looking to prioritize something like motion clarity, right? So um, that, that's a really good point. And I think even uh, segueing that too, um, we can yeah. actually touch on kind of an alternate choice again to the PG279QM, which is a formal G-Sync monitor. We mm -hmm. do have the ROG Strix XG27AQM, uh, which will yeah. be a G-Sync compatible base monitor. Um, and But this one will offer very similar class of specification, but it will uh, come in at a little bit of a lower price point. Uh, but you still hit a lot of that really sweet specification uh, that I think a lot of enthusiasts are looking for. So you've got, you know, your 1440p, so 2560 by 1440, 27 inches, fast IPS, um, supports that base. Of course, 144 hertz, but can be overclocked at 270 hertz, uh, 0.5 milliseconds, uh, gray to gray response time. Um, and then alongside, of course, HDR 400. And um, keep in mind that for many of the ROG Strix monitors too, on a high level, it's important that we're not talking about it always here, but you do have kind of general things like our ergonomic design is very prevalent in all of our monitors. Yeah. So things like being able to, you know, push down the panel, push up the, the panel, right? Be able to tilt, be able to pivot, uh, be able to rotate. All those things are generally going to be always available on our ROG Strix series. And, and that's important because ergonomics, it really is an important part of kind of setting up your monitor, make you feel comfortable and enjoying it in your kind of desk setup. Um, so I don't want you to kind of forget that. Um, and of course, for the kind of the desk setup guys, uh, and gals, whoever is kind of looking to set up those monitors, um, pretty much all of them will also have that base amount support. So if you want that flexibility to put it on an arm, position it in different kind of setups, right. then of course that is also something you have available to you. Now, I mean, so because there's, just, there's, you were saying there's a bit of overlap here. This is similar to what we were talking about before. Is this the reflex support 
and and this is now a G-Sync compatible monitor. Are those correct? Yeah, you step down from that G-Sync right. module um, to uh, to not having that. So this is a G-Sync compatible base unit. So you're going to lose that NVIDIA reflex. You'll lose some of that more advanced, specialized kind of overdrive processing that is available uh, when you have that NVIDIA base G-Sync uh, module present. Um, but you still have G-Sync validation. So of course, um, you still be able to have that. Uh, tear-free gaming experience. It's still been validated to be artifact-free, still extraordinarily fluid in terms of the overall mm -hmm. response time and the performance. So a great option um, still, you know, for those of you that are in that 1440p, um, I think it really comes down to, you know, from the users is that, you know, do they value um, kind of going to that next level of wanting the most advanced type of 1440p experience with NVIDIA Reflex as having those as a, a set of options available to you. So maybe if you're not, maybe somebody that's playing a lot of those more kind of e-centric uh, excuse me, esports centric titles, right? Yeah. Um, then maybe this is a is a is an option for you here. You're still going to have, of course, super low response time, uh, very uh, high refresh rate, right? But uh, the reflex really helps to take it to that next level within a lot of those competitive first person titles, right? Uh, online, right? So if you're not kind of in that camp, um, then this is, I think, a great all around monitor. So like me. I play games across the entire spectrum, but I really don't play that many competitive online first person shooters. So the XG might work really well for me, but I'm also a real tweaker. So I really appreciate the value and reflex. So it's a hard call to make, but that's kind of where you see the division between those two. I gotta say, I mean, the move to higher refresh, as I've gotten older, I I'm I'm gonna sound like the cranky old man here for just a second. Uh, as I've gotten older, I actually have had issues with first person shooters. And it seems like stepping up to a higher refresh rate monitor has kind of helped calm my stomach for a longer play session. Oh, you, no, you, you actually nailed it. Um, yeah, you, uh, sorry, sorry, just also to answer in the chat, somebody was asking, has the giveaway ended? No, uh, the link is gonna oh, be no. present. So don't worry about that. JC is gonna make sure you guys yeah, kind of have an understanding we'll at the end of the care. stream don't here, but it is still active, it is still going. So don't worry about it. But I'm actually with you too. I'm very sensitive to kind of flicker and actually uh, part of the validation process that NVIDIA does, doesn't actually, it does include flicker sensitivity analysis to the panel. Um, and generally I do find that gamers that had more kind of aversion to being like in a game, like really that was fast and kind of twitch and shooter and kind of they get a little bit nauseous or uncomfortable it's very similar to kind of the VR fatigue where like people that originally yeah. tried a lot of the first VR headsets that were low refresh rate um, and kind of low frame rate, they really got uncomfortable and nauseous playing that. But as kind of the technology improved and the refresh rate got higher, right, they were more comfortably able to enjoy the VR experience. And that's very similar here is that if you have G-Sync and you're playing, you know, at that 144, you're playing at that 240, I definitely do find um, that that flicker freeness and that fluidity um, helps to kind of just have it be a more comfortable experience for you when you're gaming. For sure. I mean, it, it kind of threw a little cold water on uh, on my first person shooter in Battle Royale gaming. And I'm, I feel like I'm starting to get back up to speed again, which uh, I'm, I'm still going to get absolutely crushed <laughs> in any kind of public gaming. Um, well, uh, you know, now you got a little bit of an edge now, right? Now you got a little bit of an edge. <laughs> yeah, you can step it up a little bit, a little bit. A little bit. Uh, right? Again, the, the hardware isn't going to completely overshadow my lack of skill as I get good. Um, uh, yeah, we, uh, which, which, uh, which monitor did you want to go to next? I had the so, uh, I mean, next is going to be, uh, I think an increasingly kind of popular segmentation that we've seen. I still think the 27 inch 1440 P is kind of really mm -hmm. where the big sweet spot is, but next we want to talk about ultra wide, um, oh, I think yeah, gaming. Sure. And so here we've got uh, a new monitor too, that's coming out, which is going to be the XG three, four, nine C. And so here, this again, this will be a G sync based compatible, but we step up from 27 inches to 34 inches. So this will be a 13, uh, 3440 by 1440. Uh, this will support up to overclocked 180 hertz, um, one millisecond great, a greater great response time. You have uh, our ELMB sync technology, which is our backlight strobing technology. And I, I tell you guys that if you've never tried out a backlight strobing implementation, this is something that we worked on a really long time on, and it is quite impressive. Some people actually even find that backlight strobing with a high refresh rate value can actually exceed even sometimes the motion clarity experience that they might have at purely a high refresh rate. Um, so what I mean by that is that some users actually can find that like enabling it on a 240 hertz monitor with ELMB might find that the actual motion clarity benefit is superior than that um, than purely from a 360. But keep in mind with something like our 360 hertz monitor, um, NVIDIA does have their own implementation, uh, ultra low motion blur, ELMB. 
Um, and there's also, like I said, more specialized options, like there's an actual uh, eSports mode that is built into the 360 hertz monitor that if you enable, they've hand tuned the panel uh, to specifically optimize actually gamma performance, uh, rendering performance and, and other attributes to really be able to reduce response time even further. So there will be kind of specific things you kind of want to keep in mind. But um, ELMB is something that I don't want you to guys kind of lose out on. It's a really impressive feature really exciting technology. And on this monitor, you'll see that uh, we actually have ELMB Sync. So a big breakthrough that actually ASUS made uh, not that long ago was that before, if you ran backlight strobing on the monitor, you could not have adaptive sync. So that means that like you could have your high refresh rate, but you could still potentially have tearing. And we finally were able to kind of resolve that and be able to allow you to run ELMB simultaneously with adaptive sync. That is why we call it ELMB sync. So um, it really helps to maintain kind of that tear-free gaming experience that has now become so much more enjoyable. So when you're taking a look at our monitors, do keep that in mind. You can either see ELMB uh, or ELMB sync. And if you've got that ELMB sync, that's kind of the best kind of uh, realization for that option. Uh, there's also, of course, the display HDR 400 that's also here. You also have USB type C connectivity, which is pretty cool. So with more devices now having display output support from USB type C, like our latest generation of ROG laptops and uh, mm -hmm. you know our Vivo uh, series of laptops, our Zen uh, laptops, you can now output directly from that device during USB-C. There's also cool functionality that the USB-C can give you. Like if you're scrolling through there on the page, you can see like you've actually got um, power support where you could like connect, like let's say your phone, get up, yeah. up to 18 watts that has passed through. Um, you can also have like a KVM switch functionality because there's upstream and downstream ports that are on uh, the monitor. So that's pretty cool because that can actually allow you to have like two devices and essentially have like a KVM like experience where so you don't have to have essentially multiple connections and switch and everything. You can keep one set of peripherals um, but they're running into the monitor and then still have them work across your devices. Um, so this is, I think, becoming kind of a little bit more of a norm for some specialized kind of scenarios, whether maybe it's like streaming setups or just kind of users that might have both a laptop and a desktop um, yeah. kind of setup. So that's a pretty cool option that you have here. So really great monitor for those that are kind of wanting to bridge into maybe having something that's wider, um, but still not compromise on, like I said, high refresh rate, having the GSYN compatibility, um, response time, um, you know, and uh, having that nice also increase in, in resolution as well, right? Uh, I, I, being the uh, the phone nerd that I am, I, I love the idea of being able to like plug in a Samsung, go to DeX and, and not have to have like another computer in the mix. So I mean, like KVM yep. is it again, do you, do you ever do you ever just kind of sit back and think like, man, I'm mad I didn't think of that like five <laughs> years ago, like, building a KVM switch directly into a monitor seems like a no brainer once you see it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like sitting for sure. Right I, a, a lot of these things like uh, and there's stuff that we've been ahead of the curve on like we had monitors years ago that had uh, Qi wireless charging built into the base yeah. of the monitor, right? When like, only a few phones even had it. And people were like, why would you want to do that? Now there are tons of people that they have like a wireless charging base that they put on their desk <laughs> just for that purpose, right? So, um, you know, that is an area that, you know, like we talked about at the beginning of the stream, um, ASUS has prided itself, but always kind of wanting to really be at the forefront of the industry, be innovative, um, not only in kind of the, the aesthetic design, but in the feature and the functionality design to be able to give you a better experience. And so um, that's, I think, a great example of this, right? Where we try to introduce stuff that, you know, is, is cool, is functional, is beneficial, um, you know, and, and just ultimately give you a better experience, right? And it's not always going to be purely gaming. Like that KVM function, it's not really a gaming feature, but it's realistic in terms of that it's more practical, right? It makes sense. Or not having to have another wire to be able to charge my phone where I can just have that USB-C cable, have 18 watts, which is fast PD charging support, right? Yeah. And then simplify all that. Well, and and especially over the last year that we've been through, I, you know, I, I feel like gamers were a little ahead of the tech curve when companies started doing more work from home, when you had to start moving students into virtual classrooms and spaces that are premium. We talked about this on our last stream. Like I don't have the family computer desk that my parents had. You remember we used to have that one yeah. chunk of like a living room with a giant tower and a huge CRT that was carved exclusively for, for the home PC. And, you know, we, we spent months with family and friends, like trying to do their work remote from a laptop on the couch. And, and when you see something like this, um, for me, there are these obvious like trigger points, like, oh, 
oh, this could have been like a gaming experience on a console. I could plug that directly into my wife's laptop if we needed her to have some kind of functional setup. It, it yes. saves so much space. I mean, it's a huge monitor, but it, it does it, it, it prevents us from needing to duplicate having a separate monitor for her, a desk setup for me, a, a school zone for my daughter, it, those kinds of things like as, as we can like encourage gaming to be the tip of the spear, gaming hardware to be the tip of the spear on the entire connected household is really exciting to me. I, it, it becomes one purchase that is far easier to justify to my wife. <laughs> than, than no, definitely. I mean, if a product can, can give you more flexibility, I think it's always going to be an easier expenditure. And, and actually, there's a user that's asking actually about, um, you know, some of the monitors definitely, I think we've been progressing down some of the other monitors giving alternates between, you know, a higher end offering and then kind of a more mid range offering. Mm -hmm. um, our product portfolio is also stacked because this user only has like a 1660. And um, mm -hmm. We have our kind of product portfolio specifically designed where we have ROG, which doesn't have Strix designated, will be kind of usually our flagship, our highest end monitors. We then have ROG Strix monitors, which will kind of fit in that uh, mid range, which will make up a lot of different monitors across a lot of different price points. And then we have our tough gaming lineup of monitors, which really hit, try to hit that kind of sweet spot value proposition of giving gamers those key kind of performance specifications, right? But at a more aggressive price point, but still not compromise. I mean, you can still get high refresh rate monitors. We've got tough gaming monitors that, you know, 165 Hertz, 1080p, we've got 1440p. We have, yeah. you know, curved options. We have non-curved options. We have ones with G-Sync. The only kind of difference you'll find is that we don't have any tough gaming monitors that feature the formal G-Sync module. You have to step into the ROG class to get a monitor that features the actual G-Sync module. Um, so all the tough gaming monitors, if they do feature G-Sync certification support, it will be G-Sync compatibility. But as we've talked about, that can still offer you a great experience. That's still a great um, experience. Exactly, and and you can get tough gaming monitors. Um, like I said, we, we've got those on promo. There's even ones that we right now we have one literally on promo at Newegg that you're talking about um, easily underneath um, you know, three hundred and fifty uh, dollars, right? So you don't have to spend a huge amount to be able to get into a great gaming monitor from ASUS. Um, it just kind of depends on what is your target for again the resolution and what's your target for the dimensions, right? But you know, okay. we've got again uh, really kind of all those kind of key sizes that you're going to be looking for, and I think that actually gives us a, a, a yeah. Good that, I mean, it's a, it's a good it's a good transition point here, and, and especially for a GPU yeah. like the sixteen sixty, like I wouldn't write that card off. That is still a wonderfully capable card for getting. Oh, for sure, gaming for done. sure, and uh, you know, complementing other... it with the right tier of monitor is, is going to be exactly, really and that, different. and I think that's the question too, right? Is um, you know, it all depends, right? It's relative, um, you know, but a good thing too in here, um, you know, Nvidia has the GeForce Experience software, which again, if you're kind of not as technically adept, one really great thing about that is that they do have performance profiling that they have built into the software. So a great thing you can do is you can go in there, you can scan your games and it can help to set your settings for you in relation to kind of your target, either quality level or your performance level for the resolution you want. And um, it's important to keep in mind, right? That depending on your game engine, right? Um, you know, even with a class of GPU like that, 1440p can be playable. Like if you're playing Overwatch, so you can mm -hmm. entirely play 1440p on a 1660 um, oh, for yeah. the graphics card, right? If you're talking about something like Cyberpunk, okay, it might not necessarily be the case. So you shouldn't immediately validate your kind of selection based purely on what kind of conjecture of the community might be. It really does come down to is that what are the games you're going to be playing? Because depending on that, um, that might make sense. It goes, hey, I can, I don't have to be limited to only thinking about a 1080p monitor, right? I can think about a 1440p. And the other part to think about is that you're not only always gaming on your monitor, right? Um, many times you might be using your monitor for just desktop usage, right? So you're, yeah. you're watching a, a new egg live stream, right? Maybe you're checking out some <laughs> stuff on YouTube. You're doing some email, right? You know, you're looking at photos. Having even just a 1440p versus a 1080p, it's a much larger screen space. It's just more flexible at being able to move windows around, have two things side by side and just have a, a more immersive desktop. So even if you can't natively render at that game resolution, um, you still might enjoy a better experience as a whole um, just by jumping up to a larger resolution. So kind of just keep that in mind. Um, oh, but I think, um, you know, moving from actually 1440p, mm -hmm. I think one of the next monitors we want to touch on here is actually the ultra high uh, refresh rate genre. So here we can move into the RG Swift 360, or its technical name, the PG259 uh, uh, QNR, right? Because we do have one that has NVIDIA Reflex support, and then there's one that doesn't have NVIDIA Reflex support. But this was a really exciting monitor for us. Um, and really, this was a kind of a next level, right? So we helped to, like I said, introduce everything from the first 120 to then, you know, higher refresh rate, then moving into 240. 
then 280, and now 360, <laughs> right? And so with 360 hertz, it's it's the cream of the crop. It's the fastest you can get. Um, truly impressive. This was actually a specialized panel in terms of the design and development from uh, NVIDIA, right? So it's a dual driver IPS-based display. This is a kind of a big trend difference because historically, um, usually with ultra high refresh rate monitors, you usually saw TN panels. And while TN had significantly improved, um, you know, with native 8-bit bit panels, you had yeah. pretty good actually color accuracy, um, good color uniformity. IPS still generally would offer better color reproduction, uh, better viewing angles. So being able to have an IPS-based display that you can then utilize with this ultra high refresh rate, right? Um, then you added things like the NVIDIA Reflex, the uh, one millisecond graded gray, um, and then also, um, you know, the native G-Sync module and all the enhancements that come along with that, you get something really excited. And I, again, even something you won't necessarily see in all the reviews is keep in mind that there are specialized modes that have been built into this monitor that help you to even extend the performance further with things like that esports mode that you can go in and toggle. Um, the esports mode, if you actually want to see it, it is documented on NVIDIA's website and details, and it'll help you understand that there are once it's enabled in specific game environments, it not only can lower the actual response time, but like I said, it will specifically help to calibrate the panel and improve things like um, shadow uh, illumination or kind of boosting of dark areas in games uh, where it'll op uh, optimize things like the gamma performance and a lot of other kind of variables. So, so there's a lot of kind of subtle tech that's built in here to give you the edge and kind of improve upon the experience, especially in that first person scenario. So. If you're really kind of looking for that ultra high level of, uh, you know, uh, refresh rate, this is what you're definitely going to want to look at. And this one does feature the native G-Sync module. Um, the one variant too, the QNR version, does also come with our new clamp-based uh, desk mount, which you can kind of see if you see it there on the product page. One of the cool things about okay. the kind of the clamp is that it's a kind of a C-mount clamp. Instead of having this kind of traditional uh, base design uh, on the monitor, you can essentially just C-clamp it onto the desk and that allows for kind of a cleaner um, aesthetic. So you can kind of see right there, uh, for those of you that want to have that nice. really clean, smooth, stylized aesthetic um, and eats minimal amount of desk space, um, you can remove uh, essentially the standard mount, right? And you have that C-mount clamp. And I've anybody that might be asking there, will we sell that separately? Uh, we are uh, we we are looking at bringing in uh, this clamp for our kind of ROG series <laughs> monitors at a later date. So if that's something you're interested, make sure to watch Newegg, watch our social media channels for information there. I was gonna say, I, I burned too much cash trying out different monitor arms to kind of replicate <laughs> something like that. They never seem to fit quite right. So yeah, they, I'm they very curious to see what you guys do there. Yeah, it's a very clean kind of elegant design. Um, and I think uh, shifting over from this monitor, um, we actually are stepping down to even a, a more cost accessible version here with actually the first tough gaming monitor, which is gonna be the mm -hmm. VG258QM. Um, with this one, you're still getting ultra high refresh rates. So we're going over kind of that you know, 144, 165, 170, uh, 180, um, and even over 240, this one is up to 280 hertz, 0.5 milliseconds grade degree response time, supports our ELMB tech, is G-Sync compatible, and display HDR 400. Um, so this is a really great option. So if you're somebody that, again, is playing a lot of those game titles where you're looking uh, for a monitor that, you know, you want to be able to have that better class of experience, but like I said, you can't necessarily make the jump all the way up into the in terms of the PGE, um, mm -hmm. This is going to be a really great choice for you. And uh, this one at the VG 2 AQM, I think it comes in at about like a little over 300. So it's like 310 or something like that. Nice. Um, so it's pretty crazy that you can get that level of performance, I think, even at that price point, right? And so again, like I talked about in our tough gaming lineup, if you want to go down to maybe something more basic, like um, you know, 165 hertz, you could definitely go up below that $300 price point, no problems. So we've got a lot of different options that are available for you there. Uh, but here you can see, like I said, still nice, clean uh, aesthetic there, but still get that ultra high refresh rate. I, I love the way you guys do the uh, the rotating on the monitor stands too. It's it's uh, it, it's solid and reassuring for when you're making those adjustments. 100%. 100%. So um, I think for the most part, that covers most of ours. We've got just a couple of last couple of hands here that I just want to touch on quickly, and then we can kind of mm -hmm. help to round things out with talking a little bit on kind of some design things on the GPU side specifically. Uh, but we also have uh, the uh, PG43 uh, UQ. Um, so this is going to be a kind of a little bit of a different segmentation target here. I would say that for those of you that are, might be looking something maybe in the I would say almost like kind of living room. We do have users yeah. that do use these on their desk. Um, uh, if they've got you know a large wide desk, maybe they mount it to the wall, but this is 43 inches. So 
you get your 4K 3840 by, uh, excuse me, yeah, 3840 by 2160, 144 hertz G-Sync compatible. This is a display HDR 1000. Um, it's not a full array local dimming. It is an edge lit based display, but still very, very good uh, uh, color gamut and color volume performance. Um, and you get a lot of our kind of key technologies built in here. It does also support DSC, which is important because that means that you can still have 10 bit um, essentially kind of color performance um, as supported with NVIDIA GPUs and the driver and then the panel. Uh, but if you kind of want that large format gaming, right? Which, cause it is kind of, there is yeah. no way to, to kind of just take away from the fact that when you jump into a really large panel, uh, it just offers a bigger level of immersion. So like, I love like racing games. So like jumping into something like Forza in this or jumping into something that's really world environment. So The Witcher or in the Blind Forest, you know, Divinity Original Sin, um, you know, Baldur's Gate, uh, you know, stuff like that. This is really just kind of going to open up a whole nother kind of world environment for you. So if you're looking for big, this is, I think, a, a really solid choice here. And this one also does feature the ELMB sync technology, too. I, I was I was critically interested in uh, in checking one of these out. Um, I, I've been kind of a crank crankily vocal about some of my experiences with smart TVs and how they're not that smart and i have to hook up another box to them anyway and there's this kind of running gag on on my discord server about like well just get a monitor like just yep. cut out all of that get get a great panel you know you can hook up your own speakers you can do anything you need to do to kind of customize your office experience and then seeing like 43 inch 4k hdr oh yeah th those it are really all, gives you a great experience those and are all the things that i want in a tv and <laughs> and you get and you get that guaranteed monitor performance because that is a critical difference. Some people don't understand that TVs have specialized yeah. kind of processing and different different other things that are kind of focused specifically for video. But now I might not always be suited to actually also being used traditionally as a standard monitor. Uh, when you talk about like image retention, when you talk about things like actually sharpness and text detailing, um, and actual. Um, just a lot of kind of subtle variations. There's kind of optimizations that occur, but we still have tried to bridge that divide. That unit does come with 10 watt speakers that have their own smart mm -hmm. amplifiers built in. So you actually get pretty good uh, punchy, reasonable audio there. If you don't want to have to quote unquote use headphones or speakers, it does come actually with the remote too. So you can access things like the on-screen display. So there's a good hybrid kind of experience of using this like you might use in a television, but it's still at its core, a gaming monitor, right? Yeah, and, um, and, and it's those things that you were talking about, like all the extra processing that goes on t goes on on TVs that I think a lot of us also try to get get away from, you know, like yeah. some of the more absurd motion smoothing processing modes on our televisions. Like, I, I don't. I don't, I don't yeah, want it can be hard. It can be hard too, right? I think you make right. a good point there that, um, you know, some <laughs> televisions, they, they do kind of like these specialized like post-processing enhancements where it might be not like a native actual refresh rate. When we're talking <laughs> about the refresh rates that we see here on these monitors, um, you know, if it's 120, if it's 144 hertz or whatever it might be, that's actually the legitimate refresh rate as opposed to some kind of interpolated or kind of process yeah. speed that many times people will disable those because they're not always kind of the happiest with how they kind of perform, right? Yeah, I'm um, not impressed. <laughs> so I think the, the last part here, we'll still definitely spend some time to talk about some good nuts and bolts here. Um, For sure. Is going to be, I think, on the graphics card side, right? So I think we give you guys a pretty good breakdown of kind of a range of the monitors. And here, I think we just want to touch a bit on kind of what, um, you know, Asus does in terms of coordinating with NVIDIA to give you guys a better experience when you talk about an Asus series graphics card. Um, and so, you know, we've got two different series of Asus graphics cards that we really want to focus on today. It's going to be the ROG Strix versions and then our tough gaming version of our graphics cards. And those are going to be across the lineup. So we've got, you know, from, of course, the highest end. Uh, so, you know, of course, the latest stuff like the 3090, 3080 Ti, all the way down to, you know, something like a 3060 series, right? Across the board, um, we have those available within the Tough Gaming lineup as well as in the ROG Strix lineup. Um, but what fundamentally is kind of the ethos? The ethos for us when we try to kind of communicate to a user what is the value add is our kind of mantra being cooler, quieter, and faster and built better. So cooler, quiet, and faster really, I think, is speaking to the point of that we want to ensure low temperatures, right? So you have a cool, stable, reliable card. 
which also will help to increase performance. Uh, faster is that many times these cards are gonna feature higher programmed clock speeds and higher default uh, what's called board power, which means that the actual card will even offer better performance that you would have with standard version cards. Um, and then kind of the build better part is also gonna be tied into even the construction. So um, this is actually a pretty cool video here. I can show you guys. So I think JC, you'll have to uh, show them here. I'll, I'll, got... I'll throw, yeah, I'll throw back to you. Uh, we've got a, a, a very cool process that we actually call here, which is called ASUS Auto Extreme. Uh, so we're the really kind of singular manufacturer across the industry to be able to offer what's called SMT production on our graphics cards. And what that essentially means is that we have essentially a robotic assembly process that occurs replacing all the components on the card. So you're seeing that happen right there. I've got a card here in my little side box, right, with no... A thermal assembly. But traditionally, there were people and there are still cards that are manufactured where they're placing hand components on the card. Um, we have now moved to across the board, whether you're buying something like a 3060 to a, a 3080 Ti, it doesn't matter. And even our you know 1660 class cards, any any card in our lineup are all produced utilizing Auto Extreme. So that means whether you're buying our flagship most expensive cards or our entry graphics cards, um, regardless of the positioning, you're getting the advanced base technology that we're using for the production process. This helps to just have superior consistency and reliability um, and really be afforded that you know that you have the best kind of class in terms of how the card is being produced. Here you can see everything, like I said, from those components being placed on there to the actual um, validation process where we actually have to analyze all the components being placed on there. And so that's what we mean kind of by that built better process. So um, before I kind of get into talking a little bit about some of the key differences between the ROG uh, Strix and the Tough Gaming mm -hmm. cards, know that regardless, you're gonna get that kind of cooler, quieter and faster mantra, but you're also gonna get that auto extreme production process built into them. So that's a really exciting thing that we've now had for years, but sometimes, yeah. you know, the spec doesn't always detail that, right? When people are just looking for like, I want this card versus this card, you might not fully realize that there's that value add um, that we're bringing to that from the construction side, right? Yeah, especially that QA conversation is, is, is always intense and it's hard to untangle if all you're looking at are, well, how many, like, what are the shaders in the cores? Uh, the yeah, cores, because the a, a, GP, a GPU is going to be a GPU, you know, uh, a 3060 to a 3060, <laughs> NVIDIA is going to help to ensure that you have that consistent level. But there will be definitely differences that are brought in, and that's something that we're bringing in. We're bringing in that production process expertise, and then we're bringing in our focus on things like the design assembly. So um, for the latest generation for Ampere, one of the big things that we uh, refined was, of course, going to be what is called the, the heat sink assembly. So this is actually from a prior 20 series. Um, but this is the actual heatsink fan assembly. But I, what I wanna show you is actually something that's cool that we did introduce um, that we've now bridged over to offer on both the ROG Strix cards and uh, our Tough Gaming cards. So when you see it listed on the GPU page, it's gonna be something that's called Max Contact. And um, what I actually wanna show you here is if we get a little bit closer, is gonna be a cool visual of this. So here you can see this is actually a prior generation direct contact copper kind of heat pipe design. This is what was commonly utilized and still used by actually many other uh, graphics card manufacturers. You can still have very, very good high, uh, high performance here, but we've kind of evolved it to take it further here with what we call our max contact. You'll see this is super shiny and super smooth. It's actually a precision machine surface. It's very close to the kind of quality that you would have on a precision uh, water block. So, and kind of custom water cooling, it's very smooth. It allows us to actually have a flatter, smoother surface. And that ultimately helps to translate into overall better thermal performance. And you can see you still then have your nickel plated copper heat pipes that are right there and that goes into the heat sink assembly. But that is kind of a fundamental difference. But that is gonna be present on both the ROG Strix and on the Tough Gaming cards. Um, so that is a really cool te technology that we have that we've now implemented on the cards. That works alongside, of course, the new type of fans. Um, these are called our Axial Tech fans. These are specifically optimized for static pressure. They have actually a ring uh, that is there to help to kind of focus airflow down into the actual heat sink assembly. Um, and we have actually <clears throat> a full brace that's on the card to help to provide what's called reduced torsion. So when you install the card, you can actually get PCB flexing and torsion. This helps to keep the card more rigid and reduce things like um, sag. You then have items like even the IO plate, you might not think that you would change something like this, but we actually are using premium materials. We're using steel, uh, stainless steel. Almost no other vendors are actually using that. That actually makes this um, not only of course resistant to things like oxidation and, and rust, but it gives us a key benefit that it actually has higher tensile strength. So even when it's getting mounted inside the frame of a chassis, it structurally is more firm, um, it's more rigid. 
Well, um, especially because this generation of cards seems to have also been a, a modest size increase over. For sure, the definitely the cards got bigger. Um, many of the cards, you know, are going to be uh, two point seven slot or larger, so that means that they take up almost you know three slots effectively on the motherboard. So you want to be able to make sure that the cards can fit in there comfortably and not have kind of sag, and be able to make sure that everything is working well. Um, one really cool technology too that I want to kind of speak to is going to be here on the uh, PCI power connectors. So on the ROG Strix cards, one really cool feature that we introduced new this generation is that um, in prior generations, we actually had an LED that was built onto the card. Um, I might be able to show you there in a close-up, but I think that's okay. Um, but uh, the LED would essentially that when you connected your power supply cable, it will let you know that your power was actively being fed to the card, right? So that helped you just feel more comfortable to like, hey, I'm connecting everything, everything's working, right? But we thought, how could we make that better? Well, what we did is we implemented actually a voltage circuit onto the graphics card. And we can actually detect voltage deviance. So um, there's a, essentially a mandated specification. And so once it exceeds a 10% voltage deviance from the power supply, the actual LEDs will illuminate on the card. Um, the reason why this is important is statistically what we actually find commonly in systems is that the DRAM, uh, the PSU, and actually CPU installation actually tend to be the most common points of failure within a system. Um, so having something that can help you to alert the fact that your PSU actually might not be clearly faulty, but maybe operating outside of its actually normal operating parameter is something that's really, really valuable because most people, they don't have maybe the techno aptitude or the equipment to have something like a multimeter and knowing how to actually tear the thing apart and checking and seeing, yeah. oh, is my PSU working in relation to this voltage? Oh, I'm not gonna crack a PSU. That, that, is, <laughs> uh, that is above my pay grade. <laughs> exactly. And uh, so here you don't have to worry about it. When you buy an ROG Strix card, they now feature that actual voltage monitoring circuit that's built in. So the actual LEDs will illuminate and help you to know, hey, I'm now getting this to be triggered. So maybe I should be a little bit mindful. You know, maybe I should stress test the PSU. Maybe I want to see if it's working. Maybe I want to contact the PSU manufacturer and look into maybe a warranty uh, for that. So this is another way that we've kind of evolved, again, the kind of the quality and the experience that you get with the graphics card. Um, another kind of area, too, that where people kind of wonder is what is kind of the difference fundamentally from, let's say, like a base design card? So NVIDIA sets an outstanding kind of experience with things like their Founders Edition, right? It's a guaranteed level of performance that when you see the benchmarks, you see the reviews, you know exactly what you're going to get for this 3060 or for this 3070 or 3080, right, or 3090. Um, and our goal, what we do is when we're designing these non uh, kind of quote unquote reference cards or our self-designed cards is actually the better kind of term here to use, is that we look to evolve uh, the component tree and customize things like what is called total board power. Now, what does this actually ultimately translate to? Well, we can kind of talk about things from a couple of specific perspectives in terms of kind of giving some comparisons. So um, one might, uh, example might this be something like if we take a look at the 3060, let's say like TI, your base clock speed is gonna be up to uh, 1410 for the base clock and then up to 1665. But take for instance, our card will go up to a boost of 1860. So inherently you're getting essentially an overclock on the card out of the box. But there's also another fundamental difference. You'll have actually elements like what is called the, the uh, board power. So with the board power, the default uh, envelope on the card, I think is approximately like 200 watts. Our card will be up 200, up 240 watts, but it will also allow for actually a higher level that can be adjusted through um, the actual GPU tweak utility software up to say it's like 325 watts. So that means essentially you can get even a higher level of performance. This is a critical part that differentiates our cards in terms of not only kind of tough gaming to ROG Strix. ROG Strix cards will always have the fastest clock speeds built out of the box compared to let's say a tough gaming card and have a higher uh, uh, what's called total uh, board limit power or total graphics card power. Um, along with things like the premium elements, like let's say the, you know, the uh, voltage monitoring or even like the RGB illumination. This tough gaming card, it's got a really nice, clean, stylized monochrome aesthetic, beautiful, even a full aluminum shroud here, full uh, metal backplate as well, right? But the RGB lighting zone, it's much more distinct. It's small right here. It's just clean, nice RGB. It's fully controllable and syncable with our graphics cards. But like on the ROG card, you got a full RGB LED right. light strip, right? that you can really kind of take it to the next level in terms of offering a kind of stylized aesthetic on the card. But that is um, kind of one of the key differences there, kind of understanding what do you get when you transition to our self-designed cards in terms of the performance uh, benefits that they can offer. Um, the last part is gonna be 
on something I can show you guys here. If I can cut in here, let me see if I can uh, get into it right here. Um, you'll see right here, there's a uh, bio switch, V bio switch. And so oh, nice. you can switch it between performance mode and quiet mode. So you won't really need to do this. It's not really kind of required um, on our cards. Uh, they're already gonna be quite quiet um, when you're working under performance mode, but for users that are maybe very critical, maybe you've got kind of the system there kind of next to you in a smaller form factor system, or maybe in a tower system, and you really kind of wanna focus in on a quieter operation, we do have kind of a little uh, switch that you can tune the card a little bit differently where I'll change the fan behavior profile to even be more aggressive in terms of ramping down in terms of the fan speed to be even quieter. Um, we led the industry where the first vendor to implement what was called zero dB operating mode. It has now become industry standard on graphics cards. But what that essentially means that these fans, these fans will stop spinning when the card is underneath a certain power envelope um, and utilization. So if you're just like watching YouTube, um, you know, you're watching a stream, checking your email, even maybe some basic games that might have very, very low GP utilization, the fans won't spin at all. So you get a very, very quiet card. Um, but the moment that the, essentially the card exceeds essentially the predefined uh, power envelope target, then the fans will start spinning up to go ahead and set uh, essentially a higher level of cooling performance. But you can customize that, of course, all you want within our GP tweak utility software too. So if you want to kind of keep your fans running all the time, you can turn off the zero dB operating mode um, and you could also custom tune the fan curve. So if you want to control, you know, how the fans are ramping at what temperature points, you can also do that. The choice is kind of really entirely up to you. Yeah, I, I completely missed that when I was doing a, a sort of a, a, a mini form, a small form factor build. And like, I, I think something's wrong with my GPU. It, it's just not turning on. The fans not, aren't yeah, spinning. It, What's going on? It is confusing. It, yeah, some people like they, they see it for the first time and they're like, the card's not working because the fans aren't spinning. And it's just because uh, literally the fan has been set to that. And that's part of it. It took me longer than it should have. <laughs> well, that's where, you know, the, the manual and documentation can be your friend, you know. Um, Read the so, manual. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's um, a lot of good I, stuff that gets a good, good that's true. It, it It's a better read than I think we give it credit for. Um, yeah. I, I did want to circle back real quick. When you were talking about in performance improvements and, and power management improvements over Founders Edition cards, is this something that, that again, you've worked so hard, at you specifically, Asus has worked so hard at the standardization of manufacturing, is this what allows ASUS to have kind of a better handle on this notion of like GPU lottery? That because you're building this, because it's been roboticized and automated to a certain degree, that you that, that ASUS has a better handle on, this is the rated performance and this is how we feel we can exceed sort of the, the Founders Edition spec of that performance? Yeah, uh, you know, I think um, ASUS prides itself on having true world-class R&D teams, right? And so I think that what we really have tried to spend the time and effort on is to evaluate the customized design. So we are trying to look at all the elements like the custom PCB, the power topology. Mm -hmm. You know, if we go back again to that example that I gave with the, at the base card, the base card might've had like an eight, um, an eight, uh, power phase delivery kind of design. And then we'll go, well, we want to even be able to have a more of an envelope um, so that we're going to go ahead and implement, let's say, a 10 phase power design, right? Um, and then because we're helping design other amounts of the topology in relation to then the heat sink and everything else, we help to know where we can kind of push the envelope. And then internally, even with overclocking, there's kind of this misconception that, like, do I have to buy an OC card to be able to overclock. No, you can overclock the card regardless, right? But the benefit of us when we go through essentially the design and development of making something like the Strix card um, that is already overclocked and already has that power, uh, that uh, increase in, let's say, the power board target and the improvements on the PCB is that we can help to guarantee essentially that level of performance. And uh, speaking to that too, there's also other coordination that we can help to execute. Um, like the ROG Strix cards will generally have the highest level of like custom water block support. So we work really closely with key partners oh, like, nice. let's say, um, you know, EK or, you know, Alpha Cool or Fantex or Thermaltake. Um, to be able to be able to offer robust water block support on those cards. So for users that want to even take advantage more of that custom PCB and that higher board power limits, then they can slap a water block on there and even go to a higher performance <laughs> level, right? And so those are all benefits that definitely when we are looking at our design, we can help to kind of elevate the performance uh, that is, is offered on the card. And actually one thing I did want to forget on that I did want to note, uh, another cool feature on that Strix card is this little guy right here, which is going to be, uh, this is a prior gen, this is a 20 series, um, but it is present on our, our, our 30 series as well, but they have actually two fan headers. Um, so the cool thing right there is that 
you can take those fan headers and you can take something like here. This is our actually our brand new, our XF120 fan. If you want a cool fan, get one of those. <laughs> um, but you can plug your fan directly into the um, into the graphics card. And so the cool thing about that is maybe you've run out kind of out of fan headers that are on the motherboard. So you can actually go ahead and plug that in directly on the graphics card, right? And you would be good to go. Um, and you can assign the actual fan to respond to either the GPU temperature or you can have it respond to the CPU temperature. That's and cool. why might you want to do that? Well, because sometimes the temperature for your GPU actually might be warmer than your CPU, especially when you're gaming. So it might make more sense like if you had your front intake fans that are bringing air into the system, right? Yeah. Um, maybe those are, should respond to the GPU temperature, right? So that's a feature we already offer on our motherboards, but it's a cool kind of, I guess, additional feature that when you kind of compare the tough gaming card to the RG Strix card, another kind of differential point, right? Um, yeah, I've already and, put that together in my brain for when I'm doing a video rendering rig. I'm just like, uh, it, there's a ton of GPU compute and I want to maximize that GPU to, to get as many. Yeah, as I and, and I think one of the last things too here that I just want to talk to kind of is that there is also a whole lot of value that you have that, um, and I think a lot of what we talk about in terms of our design and development, like I said, is complementary on a lot of our cards. Right. Um, but there's a lot of value add to within the latest generation of cards from what NVIDIA's introduced with support with things like, of course, uh, DLSS, which has now gotten even into more games, right, where yeah. you can really help to extend the performance envelope um, uh, by able to take advantage, of course, that advanced AI uh, deep learning that they have in terms of that running performance. And you can see it in things, of course, with like, you know, Metro, you can see it within Warzone, which is a really popular game that people were hoping to see it implemented in, of course, with Fortnite. You got things like RTX technology and then NVIDIA Studio, which I think for me is maybe one of the biggest value propositions here where you've got everything from, you know, noise cancelization to video noise removal to, of course, uh, virtual background replacement, right? All those things that are built in inherently into the software engine, right? So when you talk about kind of the GeForce Experience software, the driver, then the NVIDIA Studio and kind of NVIDIA broadcast pieces all kind of tied in together. There's really kind of an amazing experience that you can realize from everything from, of course, your standard kind of more entry cards, something like a 3060, right? Of mm -hmm. course, all the way up to much higher performing cards. And, um, you know, even for situations like streaming here, a lot, I see a lot of people that are asking, like, how do I first start about streaming? One of the really cool things is that in the future, if you're looking at one of these cards, I see a lot of people still thinking about only having to stream based on the CPU. But um, yeah. The really great thing that NVIDIA has done here is that they have, um, you know, what's called fixed function encoding built onto the cards. And so that means that you don't even need to use like third party software like OBS. You literally could just install the GeForce Experience software, have the hardware level encoding and decoding, and it could output to Twitch. It could output to YouTube. It could output to Facebook. Right. And you have almost no performance penalty that is going to exist on the CPU. Right. It will just encode your video for you. You can have an overlay. So where your camera's fed in virtual background, noise removal, all done for you in one simple to clean use interface. And um, I think it's really, really awesome that you have that level of kind of tight integration for just a, you know, a gamer from a streamer and for a general user. Well, and that that's blurred over into other areas too. I mean, we're in a world of live streaming, collaborative online video calling software. I, if, if folks haven't, being an old school audio nerd, um, you know, I, I have 20 years of recording experience in and out of like voiceover recording studios. RTX voice still seems like magic to me. A, 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 a zero latency audio processing noise reduction plugin that operates seamlessly off of your GPU. It still seems like science fiction. So again, uh, it, even with, with some modest GPUs out there, your capabilities to expand streams, to improve quality, to uh, reduce overhead on your system so that you can keep multiple things. Like right now, I've got a lot of things on my desktop <laughs> yep. happening all at the same time to run this stream. Th this would have been unheard of, uh, you know, five years ago. And now not, not only just the software, but like we're seeing the hardware components built to this heavy multitasking capability at, at, at much more accessible price tiers than than I yeah think and really and like. i think that's the impressive part too is what you're seeing is you're seeing nvidia is of course deep investment be realized here as well you know they are bringing of course their um things that you know like the the tensor cores the rtx right and then of course the core rasterization processing all those things are kind of coming together to be able to offer really great experiences so they can give you things like that 
RTX, they can give you things like the DLSS, they can give you like things like the, uh, like the studio and the broadcast technologies, right? And even have, like I said, things that are not dependent, right? Like we talked about onboard streaming, but you also then even still have onboard recording, right? Where you can have yeah. stable recording up to, you know, 4K, right? Where you can do things, you can do hardware level things like Ansel and filter processing, a lot of really, really rich, deep stuff. And that continually also gets improved upon uh, through more updates that are done through the drivers and software that they release. So um, even things like performance tuning, you know, we have our own GPU tweak utility software where users can go in and customize things like the memory voltage, the memory speed, the GPU voltage, GPU speed, uh, power target, um, and with all those offer monitoring, but NVIDIA also for maybe users that don't want to kind of scale to have to have a, a third party utility that offers maybe more advanced functionality. They now actually have performance overlays that will give you uh, all the key metrics for your card, including the temperature, the clock speeds, um, like I said, the rendering latency, and they even have that integrated um, automatic auto overclocking performance, right? Which will help to run an algorithm that they've developed to help to even extend the performance further. So there's a lot of really rich options that again, the spec doesn't always define the experience. And I think that's right. representative uh, and, and a truthful statement for both NVIDIA and for ASUS, especially when we're talking about these products. So, um, and overall, I think hopefully you guys have been able to get some good insights into kind of seeing the kind of the breadth and depth of you know, what we're, what we internally, we call it a G squared. So it's this kind of a collaboration <laughs> in terms of um, monitors and graphics cards uh, between Asus and NVIDIA. Um, and I think a really great kind of portfolio of products. And definitely for those of you that are kind of watching this, um, whether it's, you know, live or of course in a follow-up stream, um, you know, if you guys have more questions on specific monitor recommendations, card features and functions designs, you know, um, one, check out maybe other streams that we've done on the new YouTube channel. Uh, we've done a lot of the stuff in the past and it's got really good information that you can get more insights in there. Sure. Uh, you can also make sure to check us out on all our respective social media channels, as well as our um, uh, PCDIY Facebook group, which I actually run and engage with and do weekly streams there to be able to give insights into our product designs and a lot more. Um, but it's been really awesome, I think, to be able to dive into this. Excited also that for those of you watching the stream that have taken a look at the actual page and for the Gleam Hit giveaway, Hopefully you'll be able to pick up uh, that awesome ROG Strix uh, 3070 Ti. So best of luck to whoever ends up getting to be the winner. Uh, but uh, JC, also, I just want to thank you for your time, man. It's been awesome to be oh, able to kind of sure, go man. through uh, all of this and be able to kind of talk about, I think, a, a great state, right? You know, while definitely um, it is a challenging market condition and we fully understand yeah. that, um, we're going to continue to work our best to be able to coordinate with great partners like Newegg and NVIDIA to continue to re uh replenish channel availability. And hopefully as we continue to look forward into 2021, uh, the situation will improve. And, you know, we've got a lot of exciting things, like I said, not only on graphics cards, but of course on our ever expanding portfolio of monitors for you guys, right? <laughs> no, I mean, it's exciting stuff. And, and like I said, I, I genuinely, I, I really enjoy getting to spend the time and, and kind of nerd out on this stuff with you here. You, you brought it up, but I was gonna ask specifically, was there anything on the PC DIY? Were there any special events that were coming up that, that you'd wanna plug or, um, get yeah. Uh, so, you know, we've always got campaigns going on. We actually had a cool kind of um, grads and dads kind of campaign going on. So always make sure to kind of check us out um, on our social media channels. We try to be really engaged and active with our community and there's opportunities. We also kind of closely work with uh, Newegg in terms of collaborations. Newegg is also running right now a great um, a giveaway uh, for a full system build. Uh, which we help to coordinate with Newegg as well. So, um, you know, if you're always kind of looking for that opportunity too, to be able to pick up on not only maybe some information, but some cool products, um, it's always in your best interest. Uh, you know, follow us on our respective social channels so you can find out about everything sure. that's going on. And like I said, you just want to keep up to date with ASUS. One of the best ways, definitely check us out on our social media channels. Uh, consider joining our PCDIY Facebook group. Um, and like I said, we do weekly streams. Um, all kind of the latest updates, for any product announcements or availability, I do there kind of almost as soon as we have that information. So if you kind of want to be on the inside of knowing when something's dropping, when something's coming out, um, you know, what's new and hot from ASUS, uh, it's a good place to check out. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that again. The the I lurk a lot on the PC DIY side, and it's it's a it's a really great community that you guys have been building there. So, um, always happy to kind of give it an extra shout, an extra plug. Uh, if you're not checking it out and you're you're into system building or you want more of this information, highly recommend. So, folks, um, I think that's about the the place we should go ahead and put a put a pin in this. Um, JJ, thank you so much, man. Uh, first, it's just it's just just great when we get these opportunities to catch up and. Uh, with, with where the world is going, I'm hoping that we'll we'll be able to like actually do the in-person trade show again soon. Um, just get to hang out, maybe break some bread, or you know, go find a nice like coffee or tea spot or something like that that we can uh, we can we can kind of catch up in person. 
For sure. And I and I wish the best as well to everybody joining us in the stream. Thank you guys for taking time out of your day. You know, it's the end of the week. Hopefully it's ended up positive and productive uh, for you and everybody's staying safe and staying healthy out there. Uh, we wish you definitely guys the best. And um, like I said, we look forward to if you've got questions, feel free to go ahead and tag me in the comments. I do definitely spend time after streams to try to go look through and comments and see if there's kind of specific questions on specific cards or specific monitors, different things like yeah. that. Uh, you can feel free to go ahead and uh, drop that comment in there and I'll do my best to go ahead and follow up with you guys when I can. So thank you guys again for joining us on the stream. Yeah, again, thank you all for for taking the time. I hope you all had a happy Friday. This was this was definitely the highlight of my week. Um, and uh, keep an eye out on the contest on that giveaway page because we'll be announcing a winner, I believe July 2nd. So we had we had to make it fair for the replay crew. We had to give them a chance <laughs> to, to give this a shot, um, but we're really stoked. Uh, 3070 is such an awesome card. 3070 Ti is such an awesome card, and we wanted to make sure it, it, it made its way to uh, to a loving and caring home that would definitely get some good use out of it. So, uh, folks, uh, you can catch all of the uh, the information, everything that you want to follow up on in the show notes. Definitely uh, hit those comments. Be active in the comments. We're going to be looking through and trying to reply to everything that we can. And uh, thanks so much for joining the stream. I uh, be on the lookout for some future content coming from Newegg. We've got some really fun things that I, I can't quite talk about just yet, but I think that you'll have some fun checking them out as we get them produced. Uh, for Newegg Studios, I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell. Thanks so much as always for sharing and subscribing and being a part of this conversation as we all get to kind of nerd out about this uh, this gaming stuff that we love. And uh, I'll uh, on that note, I'm going to wrap this up and I'll catch you all on the next stream. Take care.